Postgres was crashing repeatedly, the queries were returning bad results, which is always very exciting when you see those. Or you're getting scary looking error messages in the log, that's always really fun. Or everyone's favorite, backends are running for extended periods without an obvious reason, like say auto vacuum daemons. You know, just like every major traumatic situation when you're a systems administration person and a crisis erupts, you tend to go through the stages. You go denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and actually fixing the problem. <laughs> and denial is the most dangerous one of these because your first conclusion is it has to be something unrelated to Postgres. Somebody did something wrong. Postgres doesn't have bugs. Um, oh, you were running queries when it happened? I told you not to run queries when it happened. You know, so you told me the application was quiescent. You're projecting the problem onto somebody else. So okay, bargaining, fine. All we have to do is repair the rows and bring it back up and then we're done and I can go back to sleep. Um, a dumper store will fix everything. It always does, it always has. Or when in doubt, blame Amazon. Um, it's a transient EB, if, uh, you know, EBS sucks, EBS is terrible. It's all EBS's fault. We told you not to run EBS. Which we didn't, but we did now. And then, you know, you're all depressed and, you know, <laughs> you know the, the, you're, you're starting to you're realize this is going to be on Hacker News. It's just going to be awful. And then you fix the problem. You know, it's better, like, we go straight to this stage. Be aware, though. I mean, big joke, but be aware. Humans do this. And we are all just people. And we will go through these stages when confronted with, a, with, with one of these horrible situations. So move slowly, keep good notes, don't panic. And the very first step, something goes sproing. You see you're the first indication that something has gone bad in a bad way. The very first step is stop. Stop, stop, stop. Whatever your first instinct is, it will almost certainly be the wrong one. Because a crisis is a problem plus panic. So the first thing you must do is nothing, at least do no harm. If you're down, you're down. Take a deep breath, move cautiously. Don't rush towards a solution unless you are incredibly sure what the solution is. I mean, if the power cable is sitting pulled out in front of you, sure, plug it back in. But it's rarely that straightforward. So let me take a moment to talk about minimizing communication channels. How many people here work for an organization that has more than three layers between you and the CEO? Okay, I don't, which is good, because, I, because otherwise I'd be in jail for homicide. Um, <laughs> the, <clears throat> there is a, a theory, a thinking inside of large organizations that every single line employee, the only reason the problem hasn't been fixed is someone with a grand enough title has not yelled at you yet. Because obviously, as soon as someone with a director or a vice president title gets on the phone, then you'll get off your ass, stop checking Facebook, and fix the problem. You have to wonder why the companies think this, because they hired these people, and anyone who had this attitude towards their job shouldn't be working there, but companies do. So turn off your cell phone, don't answer your desk phone, pick one channel, internal IRC, whatever, and focus on that. Because everybody in the organization, if it's a highly visible problem, is going to be yelling at you to try and fix it. D worry about that later. Fix the problem first. <clears throat> Don't delete anything unless you know that's the solution to the problem. Like, you're out of disk and, the, and, the, and, um, and PG log is 90% of disk space. Then, sure, throw away some text logs. Probably be a good first step. And remember I said text logs? So, an actual conversation. <laughs> This filled up, so we deleted the log files. Now Postgres won't start. Uh, what did you delete? Everything in the log directory. <laughs> Which log directory? <laughs> yeah. I've had this conversation multiple times. It's so painful. Expensive, you know, good, you know, good for our revenue, but very painful. So keep the parts. If you possibly can, make a copy of the database before touching anything, understanding that if you're running a four terabyte database, this may not be the most practical thing in the world. If you can't, meticulously document what you change. Don't just start stabbing at the, uh, the on-disk files hoping to get it right. And just something to remember when you're in this, this, um, this existential horror that you found yourself in, 
There are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Postgres installations. Postgres works really, really well. It does have bugs, but rule out everything else first. Don't immediately go to the Postgres bug. Um, an example of this is client, very smart people, you know, they're, but not Postgres savvy, um, <clears throat> was sure that auto vacuum, everybody familiar with auto vacuum for um, XID wraparound? They were sure it was broken because it was running for hours at a time on their multi terabyte database, which had never had that vacuum run on it before. Of course it'll run for hours. It has to read every single page on the entire disk. So <clears throat> the, 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 and they kept saying, well, does Postgres have a bug? I say, no, you just have a really big database. One hour later, it's still running. Does Postgres have a bug? Talk about minimizing communication channels. Um, so work up the stack. Look for errors in dmessage. Especially when a backend crashes and you're running on Linux, you will probably go in there and find a message about the ohm killer. So adjust the ohm killer parameters. Are there disk IO errors? I mean, this is a really, just CPR the, the data directory, make sure you can read every page on the, data, of the disk, and if it gets an error saying, oh, nope, sorry, whole sections of the database are gone, you at least know what the problem, uh, an idea what the problem might be. This is a remarkably common problem, especially if people who are not familiar with what database is all about are setting it up. Um, specifically, they're setting it up on SAN or heaven help us all NFS volumes. Um, there can be memory corruption problems. RAM errors are actually remarkably corrupt. Sometimes take the number of, un of uncorrectable errors that are in the spec sheet for the RAM you have in your system and multiply it by the tied RAM and discover there are probably one or two uncorrectable RAM errors in your, hard your hardware right now. And also there can be these strange little things like making sure that PG start backup um, completes before taking, starting your snapshot. Use rsync and not scp to move vol files around because scp does not move atomically and rsync does. And so sometimes Postgres can wake up, start reading this segment and get to the end of it and start getting indigestion. Um, <laughs> keep the wall files as well, not just the snapshot backup. Um, a lot of times people do a snapshot, try and bring it back up with no wall files and Postgres will say, well, this looks awfully darn corrupt to me. And then, but they have no wall segments, so they can't, there's nothing to do. If Postgres is crashing, so first eliminate system level causes. You know, it's just, Postgres is just a program running on a computer. It crashes for the same reasons lots of things crash. Isolate the crashing behavior if you can. What table is crashing? What query is crashing? Are there any other processes on the same machine showing unusual behavior? Like, or are there any other processes the machine sucking up all of memory? Like a JVM. But, okay. What if you don't have a clean backup? Because that's always the best solution. Roll back to a clean backup. And you, you desperately need to get the system patched and back up. And you can avoid repeating the problem, which may take a little bit of diagnosis. And you have nerves of steel. Um, there are, you can patch, you know, it's just, Postgres database is just files on disk. You can patch them. I'm not going to go into all the various ways of patching them because that is far beyond a 45 minute talk. Um, and also something else to remember is the best thing is always roll back to a known good system. You may not have that option, but there's no substitute for a solid disaster recovery strategy. And remember, th this is, you're, viol you're voiding the warranty on Postgres by opening up and starting to muck around with the files directly. Um, it's very easy to get yourself into a worse situation than you were in before. So proceed at your own risk. And now that I've scared you, uh, there are no recipes for doing this. You know, like, um, by its nature, corruption is a one-off situation. So be sure to determine the extent of it before co um, continuing. And be sure you can step backwards, either because you're working on a copy so remember, work on a copy. Or um, because you're able to re undo the changes you do. If you're not able to copy the entire database, you can at least copy the individual files that you're modifying before you modify them. So the index corruption is probably the most common. Um, indexes have a lot of internal structure compared to the heap. Um, it's easy to um, it's easy to corrupt an index in such a way that the system stops running. It's harder to corrupt the heap that way. You may start getting bad results from individual queries, but um, the heap points around, it has, you know, the ind indexes have all sorts of internal pointers and all sorts of internal structure. Very easy to screw that up. Um, 
drop indexes first and rebuild them, first of all. Remember, just remember to drop them. The good part about dropping an index is you can drop a corrupt index, no problem. It just throws away the file, so it doesn't have to be valid. Um, and if you're getting these error messages, then um, error messages involving these, drop the index and rerun the query and see if it works. So all the actual data for Postgres is inside the base directory, inside, of, inside the PG data directory. Every relation has a rel file node, um, which is in PG class. And the files that make up an individual relation, that is to say a table or an index, are base, the database void, and rel file node. And it caps the file size at one gigabyte, so it'll go blah, 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 point one, two, three, four for big relations. The heap, unless you've compiled, done a special recompilation of Postgres, which you probably haven't, um, Postgres, all, all these pages are divided into 8K blocks. Um, each block has a variable number of tuples on it. Every row in Postgres has a CTID, which is the block and the tuple in block. And you, it, it's just a magic column. You can actually select it and see it for individual rows. So if you think the problem is in the heap, that is to say the actual data as opposed to the indexes, the first easy fix is set zero damage pages true. Um, if Postgres reads a bad page and think, um, or reads a page and thinks it is bad, it'll treat it as zero, which is to say it has no data on it, um, which, is, um, which of course you're gonna lose some data, but it means you can at least get, um, get a wounded database back up. And remember, drop the indexes from that table first so that you don't have indexes pointing to non-existent tuples. Um, really, really bad heap damage is things like when the backend cr crashes when it touches a particular set of rows or row. Um, you can use DD to go in and zero those particular pages. Do your math right because you don't want to be, you'll, it's very easy to smash something else badly. And drop indexes first. Um, another class of problem, and this was actually the source of the problem that, um, that I talked about right at the beginning, are problems with the, um, the C log, the commit log. Because of the way Postgres works, it needs to know whether or not a transaction is visible or not, and the C log keeps track of all that stuff. If you have missing damage or accidentally deleted C log files, and you will see this because the, log, the text log, will be, the error log will be complaining about those, um, just remember that when you create it as all zero, you're marking all these transactions as being rolled back. Not, um, so this can cause data to disappear out of your database. However, if you have to do this, you, um, frequently this is the only way you can recover. Um, one thing though to keep in mind, sometimes you'll see an error message and it'll have a C log value that's gigantic, far beyond the range of, uh, you know, in the, in, the, um, in the billions. That probably is a different kind of corruption. So don't just start creating, you know, 12 billion C log files. So it can, you can do things like how, causing transactions to reappear, rollback, and other exciting events. So once you've done this, be prepared to do C, C log. I'm not going into details about this, because, but this is, um, this is something you can, re, you, you can research. Um, it's like a tutorial level class to go through all the various ways of patching up a database, which would be a fun tutorial, actually. So one thing you can do is a dump restore. One of the nice parts about it is a newly restored database, assuming there are no Postgres bugs that, you, that are biting you, um, will, um, will be pretty guaranteed to be consistent. Of course, application level consistency is something else. It may be missing rows or missing data that, you, that the application thinks should be there. But you know that if you can successfully do a PG restore, Postgres at least will be okay. Um, the, the one, what we did actually finally to solve the problem at the beginning was we fixed the most serious data corruption and did a dump and restore onto a clean host. And that worked very well. So if you can do a clean PG dump and you have the space to put it somewhere, that's a good place to start. If you have really serious data corruption, especially the kind where individual um, queries are crashing or individual ranges of tuples are causing a back end to crash, you can do copy. You can manually copy out individual tables. The nice part about this is you can do subselects around the corruption. So you don't have to dump the entire table. 
Um, then you do a schema only dump to create the uh, new empty receiving database and copy everything back into it. This is the nightmare scenario, which is the system catalog gets corrupted. The problem is the heap isn't self-documenting. It, it isn't self-describing. The heap, if, if, there's, um, if you don't have the system catalog, the heap is just a bag of bits. It can't be correctly read. S sometimes, if the data corruption is particularly isolated, you can go in and directly patch isolated errors. One example of this is I ran into a problem where somehow a schema in PG, in, in PG, in the catalog scheme, in, the, in PG schemas, had pointed to itself as its own parent, which was causing no end of hilarity when you tried to use that schema. That was a, th then I could fix that with just an update statement. Um, so if you have that kind of thing, you can, um, do, you can patch isolated errors. If it's deeply corrupted, you may have to get an expert in to scavenge data, though. Um, tools to help you do this are page inspect. There's a contrib module, which um, lets you dump the low-level page information. Uh, control data, which is, lets you view the control data for the cluster. And reset xlog to reset the wall of control information. Now, the, of course, the right answer is don't get yourself into this situation. Planning for the dis disaster. If you run a Postgres uh, installation of any size, something like what I described here will happen to you eventually. Just as, and that's not because Postgres is super buggy, but computers suck. Hardware sucks. People, are, cloud providers spend as little as possible on hardware. It can be, um, th bad things will happen. Sooner or later, you will have to deal with this. The best way to avoid this is to be prepared for it. The first and most important way to avoid this is test your backups. If you haven't tested the backups, you don't have backups. Um, my, one of my favorite ways is you give them to developers. Is take, a, take a backup and reprime everyone's development platform with it overnight. If there's a problem with the data, you will find out right away. Um, you can also use them for analytics. You know, uh, marketing people are always saying we need, we need to run these giant, complicated marketing queries, uh, uh, marketing report queries on the database that will cause the transactional database to fall over. Give them their own copy uh, pull, pulled out of one of your nightly backups. And make sure that your restore steps are automated and foolproof. Because when you actually have to do it, you will probably have to do it on no sleep. So the right kind of backups. Do point in time recovery backups. PG dump is all very, is, is nice and it's good for emergencies and it's good for doing little thing, little um, quick stuff, but you want point in time recovery backups. And keep a reasonable number of backups associated wall segments. Um, Wall-E from Heroku is not a bad tool to do this because you can stuff everything into S3 and then move it to Glacier or just delete it on a regular basis. But you want this stuff around and S3 is pretty cheap. One of the awful things is a disk page can take a hit and you don't know about it because you just never go out and visit that edge of your database for a while. Make sure you're running with FSync on. I assume everyone is because it's horrible if you're not. And make sure FSync really happens. Um, it's uh, a lot of the time sand volumes will lie about whether or not they've really synced everything to, because of course they have battery backed up cache, so they don't need FSync um, because they're trying to get, um, they're trying to flatter their numbers. Run with full page writes on unless you're running one of the very small handful of file systems that can handle this. The only one that pops right at the top of my head is ZFS. So to, because most operating systems, uh, most file systems do not guard against torn pages. And don't kill my 9s9 anything. Please. Thank you. Um, deploy minor versions as they roll out. I realize I just told you about a scenario in which someone deployed a minor version and it was a problem. It does happen. Postgres does have bugs. It's a big, complicated piece of software. Big, complicated pieces of software have bugs. But if they, um, <clears throat> but in general, you want to be on the latest version because there are a lot because there are a lot of data corruption problems that are fixed in each new one. So acknowledged, but it's a relatively unusual situation. Also, plan an upgrade strategy so you can move to new major versions. A lot of, sometimes a problem, a, a bug fix is not backported. 
major data corruption problems usually are, but it's really painful to see these customers caught on 8.1 because they have no strategy. From, they've, they've been kicking the, oh, we'll do that major upgrade thing later down the road. PG upgrade at this point is reliable enough that we're recommending it, so I would, so that's one possibility. Turn on checksums. As of 9.3, um, there's built-in checksumming on pages. The nice part about this is it'll flag on disk corruption immediately. It doesn't fix the damage, it's not error correcting, but at least you know, and it's very important that you know things are corrupt as soon as possible. Because the, farther, the, lo the longer you've gone since the corruption, the, the more likely it is that you'll, won't, you'll be unable to recover from it, um, rec have a backup that contains the bad data, the, or the, the now lost data. Unless you have a checksumming file system like ZFS, turn it on. You do have to do it, it is, it is set at database creation time, so you, this, w this may be something you have to do as part of a upgrade strategy, but definitely do that. And you're probably not running on a checksumming file system. Sure. Um, it's not on the create DB, thank you. That's, um, okay. so I can mm. no, I'm sorry, it is on the init DB. It's cluster wide. It's not per database, so it is init DB. Yeah, thank you. I, for, init DB versus create DB is always one of those things that it takes nothing for me to confuse them. Um, so one of the things also is when you're in one of these disasters, you often will say, oh shoot, we need to fire up a new host especially if you're running on a cloud provider where firing up a new host isn't a big deal. Um, even in a cloud environment though, getting the host set up just right, like you're, you're, you're on CentOS and you're running WALL-E, oh right, we had to build Python 2.7 so we could run WALL-E successfully and install all these packages, and if it's three in the morning and you haven't had much sleep, you're going to go crazy trying to remember all the, things, the steps you went through to provision this new host. So all the packages, are you, using, um, are you using UUIDs, in which case you need the UUID libraries, blah, 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 blah. So always build these systems using a configuration management tool. So you can just push a button and get a new one without having to go through, without having to spend this entire time worrying about if you got just the wrong packet. Because there's nothing worse than one of those than going through, it's like app get this, app get this, app get this, when you're trying to get the site back up and test all this stuff thoroughly, please. Um, have automated test tools to do application level database scans. Um, the one, it's very, make sure that there's no corrupt data lurking somewhere in the nether regions of the database. You know, visit those tuples once in a while. All that old archive data that was, you know, you have a, a database, you have a table that has data from four years ago that's never, that hasn't been queried in three years. Do you know it's not corrupt? Really? Don't wait for vacuum freeze to tell you that there's a problem. Make this part of your migration upgrade strategy. So let's play a game here. Your main data center burns to the ground. Where you keep the primary production database. How do you keep your database up, back up? And how much data have you lost? Always think about this. Meteorites happen. I live in San Francisco, you know. Uh, databases, uh, eventually, every database in that geographic area will go offline at the same time. This will happen. Um, you, know, if you, um, you know, if you live in Seattle, there's a large nuclear bomb with snow on the top waiting for you in the distance. You know, it'll happen. So what's the plan? Um, and AWS regions go offline too, as we discovered when the last set of storms came through. Um, also remember things like um, speaking with a client and they said, okay, you're in 365 Maine, big data center um, built on fill in San Francisco, as there are boats underneath it from the gold rush. I said, you know, that whole ground is going to liquefy and 365 Maine is going to fall over and burn, and burn when there's an earthquake, a big earthquake, so what's the plan? I said, no problem, we've got it covered. We're at Digital Realty across the bay in Oakland. Okie dokie. Um, let's, let, maybe we want to rethink this strategy. Um, when you have these situations, have a run book. Have, a, um, you know, whether it's, you know, <laughs> in Evernote, it's a literal piece of paper, something. Um, and something that doesn't require somebody else's data center to be up to get at. Um, 
you'll, you know, the, these things are not perfect. You frequently do have to go off script from a run book, but it's very important to have this list of changes to say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. If that doesn't work, then it's time to step and go back. Because you're, the, all, these are the worst possible situations. You're be, everything is going wrong at the same time, and you do not have the, the processor capacity in your brain to sort it all out yourself. Because remember, you'll be doing this on no sleep. So you found a bug. Like, I found two bugs last year in Postgres. Two of these data corruption bugs were ones I reported. So anyone else besides me ever see the Street Fighter movie? It was really bad. Yeah, so this is the attitude that a, that people, that a lot of people will have when you report this bug. Yeah, it's, aw it's awful. The bug that you just found was the worst bug in the entire world, but if it was the worst thing in the Postgres developer's world, they would have fixed it already. And remember, no one is paid just to fix Postgres bugs. There are a limited number of people who can hack on Postgres's internals, and there aren't that many of them. So when you document a bug, be thorough. Develop a test case if you can. Databases are well understood that if you're having a bug that's run, that only crops up on your 2.5 terabyte database, building an isolated test case may prove difficult. People understand that. But document everything, even if you think it's not important. Don't over-diagnose the problem right away. Um, when I reported this first bug, I blew this. I really went straight to a diagnosis of it, and I was wrong. And that probably slowed down the bug fix. Remember that they will need data. If your data is sensitive, make sure you have a plan to anonymize it so other people can look at it. Because you know, if you have, um, if you're in the U.S., if you have HIPAA-sensitive healthcare information or something like that, you can't just throw the database onto you know on, onto onto a public server and say, here, here's everyone's cancer diagnosis records. Please let's let's fix this bug together. So have a plan to anonymize this stuff, and file a bug. There is a bug track. There is a bug filing system for Postgres. You by email, web link. There are guidelines. Please read them. If you've run into a critical bug, now, a critical is not, does not mean your life is now miserable. Sadly, that's not the operational definition of critical. If it's data corruption or repeatable server failure, not your query is running slow, consider bringing up on hackers. Um, because people want to know these things exist. Because these are bad. Databases are dad software. They just work. You know, so, you need, so it is important to, bring, to escalate these kinds of issues. But remember, everyone's busy with their own crises, too. If you have a crashing freezing bug, make, um, install the debug packages for Postgres. And if you're getting core dumps, get stack traces out of them with the symbols. That's why you want the debug packages. Um, if things are hung up, attach S trace to it to see where it's hung up. This can be very handy for one of these backend processes that's going and going and going and going. It's, show, it's not showing waiting on a lock, but it's never terminating for some uh, bizarre reason. Once you've brought this up, be persistent, but be polite. The, the biggest no-no is file a bug saying, oh my god, we're all going to die, the thing is burning to the ground, and then you never reply to any follow-up questions. Monitor these threads. I mean, I zone out on hackers all the time because the, you know, it is drinking from the fire hose, but if I've raised an issue, I will monitor for those, those, that thread. When people ask questions, answer them promptly and answer them thoroughly. And remember, don't badger them. They don't work for you. And even if they do, be nice. And the reality is, if you have a well-documented and repeatable critical bug in Postgres, it gets fixed pretty fast. So this works, is the thing. Is there's no reason to be cynical about it. Bringing up this kind of thing really does work. And if it's a total disaster, and this is an organizational thing, consider spending money. Hire a company to fix the problem. You can do that. I might have a recommendation. Um, and when your boss or you think gets, gets the quote back and then you pick yourself up off the floor and think, if you think Postgres Consulting is expensive, Postgres Consulting is not expensive. This is expensive. <laughs> Just compare the cost of, a po of, of getting one bug fixed in PostgreSQL for an annual license on this guy. No, it's not. So thank you.
and questions. I'm, you're all, you're all in, in silhouette here, so uh, wave, wave. Is the yes, it's a, it'll be on um, thebuild.com, which will be, and it will be announced on Twitter. Yes. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you spoke about uh, patching things up very easily. Can you yeah. talk a bit more about what, what that entails for, for the In this particular one, we were able to do the patching at the SQL level, as opposed to having to go in and muck with the data on disk. Um, the nice part about this is because the application, I'm not saying everybody go out and modify their schemas to include a last modified timestamp right now, just so you have, just so you have a tool, but it was very handy because, it, um, because we were able to see, find these duplicate records and throw away the, 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 the bad one. Similarly, we were able to compare the two databases and effectively using the last modified timestamp as a primary key, as a, second, you know, a secondary primary key, if that's a term, it is now, um, to, um, to find the errors between them. And, the, and write scripts that deleted or inserted the stuff into the secondary data, the new master. Um, <clears throat> because what was going on was, in effect, transactions were, um, it was almost like it was running in, it, like, the tra like because, um, things like when, some, when a tuple was updated on the secondary. The primary, was, the primary was fine, but the problem is the primary was badly out of date by the time we noticed this. Um, a new, an updated tuple would come in, but the old tuple would still persist. So there would be two versions of the same tuple with the same primary key. And the question was, well, which is the good one? And by using the last modified timestamp, we could say, well, the later one's the good one. So that was very, that we were lucky in that regard. Um, is that by itself a reason to add a last modified timestamp to everything? Probably not, but <laughs> we did luck out in that regard. Um, other things that um, I've had, generally when I've had to patch things up on disk, what we would do is look for ridiculously out of range values for things. Like um, frequently what you'll find is, is, um, he, is things that are um, to, that, like toast table pointers are sort of are a good example because they're the one things that are kind of highly structured inside of the heap. Um, the problem is that you know, kind of when you look at the sequence of bits in the heap, almost anything makes sense. You know, integers can be anything, you know. Um, but um, compressed, heap um, compressed types, you can look at things and see like, well, there's, it's supposed to be a text type here, and the range is 8 million. Hmm, that doesn't look good. And we can find things that way, searching through it. The, in the most critical situations, what you can do is, um, in effect, um, go rebuild, look at what the heap's supposed to look like based on the schema and go through it manually. But needless to say, at the point you're manually going in and doing DD to repair a database, things have gone pretty far south. Um, we've only done this in a relative, I've only done, I personally have only done this in a relatively limited number of cases, like two. But fortunately, in the case of the, the very first problem I presented, we were able to do it at the SQL level. So that was worked out pretty nicely. Uh, yes, and then you. No, because it has to rewrite the disk image. Yeah, you have to do a dump load at that point. Yeah, sucks, <laughs> sadly. Sir. I am not aware of one that goes through and does a not a, an integrity check that doesn't involve the Postgres server, which would be a great tool to have, actually. And, um, in my copious free time, I might take a stab at it. Um, but generally, you run into these things because you're getting either backends are crashing or throwing errors or getting weird messages. And so, in effect, Postgres is the, your tool to find that stuff. Sir. Dash announce post, uh, uh, the announce mailing list for Postgres. Yeah, if you it, don't do what I do, 
So let, it's too late for me, but save yourself. Um, which is dump all of your Postgres related email into a single inbox. Um, I have uh, I did that for a long time, which meant announce went into the same place as hackers and general and performance and all this stuff. And someone would say announce this is oh by the way this version of Postgres will cause genetic damage in your children, and it was just mixed into all the other emails. So now I separate those out and put them at a different level. So look at the announce the dash announce list and read and 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 read. I, it can be eye glazing. I'm the first to admit, but read the release notes for every version of Postgres because there can be important stuff in there. And it will also give you a good idea of how important this release really is. If, if it is, well, we fixed this little bug in this thing you never, in this authentication method you never used, okay, whatever. If it, but frequently you'll read this thing that says, oh, if you don't install this right, right away, you're running on borrowed time. And then you definitely want to shove a new version through. Minor version upgrades are very fast, fortunately. You just have to replace the binaries and start Postgres back up again. You can also, I'm not aware of any time that you couldn't go backwards on a minor version. Um, you may not want to, but um, like we did here, we're going from 9.1 back to 9.3, uh, 9, 1 to 9.3.0. So, but definitely if you're responsible for the, if, if somebody's gonna be upset if you're Postgres, at you personally, if the Postgres database doesn't work, follow an ounce. Anything else? Sir? As far as I, it, it is, it is de minimis. There is very little performance hit. Um, I am sure that you can, I'm sure in, you know, people do some remarkable things with Postgres. <laughs> I'm sure you can build a scenario, but I would, I, I, would, um, I would just assume it will be fine and enable them. I, I feel very comfortable doing that. No reason not to, nope. It's a it can be a little bit tricky to, to verify that. Um, you can do smoke tests. I mean, I will sometimes like pull, the, pull it out. Um, you can see if other people have had problems with the same hardware. Um, if, you're, if it's an expensive enough system, you can, you can sometimes step around the people who are selling it to you to get actual technical information. One of the things, you know, the question to ask is, so when I issue a sync against the file system, what really happens? Does it really harden everything straight onto disk? Unfortunately, a lot of these things don't. What they do is they just write it to the battery backed up cache and call it good. So um, usually at some point, someone will have found out these don't work. <laughs> they have documented this fact, but it can be tricky. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer other than, you know. But obviously this is not something, you know, the, oh, well, it runs really fast, but your data could be corrupted is usually not the bullet point they put on the glossy brochure, so. Well, battery backups can fail, um, or the battery backup, or you can be down long enough the battery drains. Um, the, you know, it's all a matter of probability, of course, if you're willing to accept that probability. There is, the thing about SANS is also, you have to, you have to have a strategy for what happens if the SAN fails also. This is something that a lot of companies treat SANS as if they're, you know, perfect. And setting aside, you know, meteorite coming through the roof and cr crushing it. Also, um, I have flash firmware on a SAN and the whole SAN went away. You know, fortunately, there were backups <laughs> of the whole SAN because I insisted <laughs> at the top of a, my squeaky little voice that they do a complete backup before flashing a new version of the firmware. Um, so, yes, sir. I think they're great. Um, two years ago, I would have had a slightly different opinion um, because SSDs were not kind of as fully baked as you want them to be. Um, now, you just make sure they are, you know, enterprise. I hate that term, but, you know, they're the expensive ones. Um, and they actually, that flush works, that trim works, and things like that. But, wow, they sure run fast. Yeah. One one thing to consider is putting um, is if you can if you if this is if this works for you, it's often not a bad idea to put the wall onto a, a very fast spinning disk. 
um, because it's being written over and over and over again, and right where can actually be a problem over time on the wall volumes. Um, also, it doesn't benefit as much from the SSD's random access characteristics as I think because it's the pen only operation. Um, so if you, especially if you have a hybrid system that has both SSDs and, sp and fast spinning disks, if you need to put something on the spinning disk, put the wall there. And yes, there's a question behind him. Oh, I think I was just going to basically point out the same thing. We actually okay. coded some SSDs. So if you are running an SSD, kind of the wall on them, really watch all these drive renders. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, because writeware is, it right, um, people, people so, uh, have gotten kind of weird and eye rolly about writeware on SSDs, but that's probably because they're using them to run word processors. Um, if you're running them on something that's taking writes all the time, writeware can still be an issue. Yes? No? Okay, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>